Welcome to the BAI Deep Dive on Fraud Prevention and Cybersecurity. My name is Holly Hughes and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at BAI. Today I'm joined by two leaders in financial services who specialize in this area. And together we'll talk about trends, challenges, and opportunities related to fraud and cybersecurity with the ultimate goal of finding out how we can minimize losses but still provide a really great customer experience. So John, David, it's great to have you both here with us today. John Colino is Senior Vice President of Cyber Operations, Corporate Security and Fraud at Wintrust. Wintrust is headquartered here in Chicago with about 150 locations in Illinois, Wisconsin, as well as Indiana. So great to have you with us here today. We also have David Vergara. David is Head of Global Product Marketing Security Authentication for OneSpan, a global leader helping banks and credit unions protect user devices across digital channels. So certainly two gentlemen very well versed in this topic. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Let's go ahead and, and dig right in. Um, I wanted to start just with a little bit of research that BAI has done. This is one of the topics that we do keep a close eye on. And we recently did our BAI Banking Outlook study, which included a few questions on fraud and cybersecurity. And it's a survey where we go out and we pull financial service leaders on different topics. And we asked them, you know, compared to last year, how do you see your fraud challenges? And 68% feel that the challenges have increased over the past uh, year. 26% said that they've stayed about the same, and only 6% saw a decrease. So certainly relevant, certainly a space that you all live in day in and day out. So John, I thought we'd start with you in terms of emerging trends that you're seeing. Um, the fraudsters get creative um, and certainly are up on, on the latest vulnerabilities. What are you seeing, especially as it relates to consumers' behavior to do more and more transactions online? Well, with uh, online transactions, any payments that uh we make more available uh, via electronic media. Obviously, the fraudsters are looking to exploit that. And now you have a situation where customers are more uh, anonymous, or the transactions are more anonymous. And uh, it's incumbent upon us in the, the fraud prevention industry to make sure that we're protecting those customers and protecting those transactions. So uh, there's several trends, or, or every time we bring up, come up with a new product, where uh, fraudsters start to exploit that or try to exploit that. And, tr you know, staying for our department, at least uh, to stay a uh, ahead of those trends to identify the products that are coming out and where the exploits may be or where uh, fraudsters may try to exploit those those products. Uh, right now, uh, we see a lot of uh, spoofing via phone. A lot of uh, everyone's got a mobile phone. Everyone walks around with a mobile phone mm -hmm. and does a lot of transactions on that, whether it's banking or otherwise. And uh, we see fraudsters trying to exploit that. Uh, spoofing phone numbers is a, a a big scheme that we see right now is trying to uh, acquire account information by spoofing a phone number or calling somebody. Uh, mm -hmm. You can bet that 99% you know, of the population is walking around with a phone. You call that phone, you say you're from the bank, to obtain uh, information that allows you to access the account is something that uh, is pretty prevalent, not just uh, with us or in banking industry, but, but really in, in all types of industry. Great. Yeah, I think, you know, it feels more and more real. Um, I think as the fraudsters get better at spoofing and, and making it seem like it actually is, is the bank. Um, David, how about you? What are you seeing in terms of some of the major threats um, the, the banks and credit unions that you work with are dealing with? Yeah, absolutely. So in, in terms of the types of fraud, uh, new account or uh, application fraud is at the top of the list, certainly. So when the cyber criminals and hackers are, are using uh, stolen PII to set up a new account, right? And they're monetizing it by just racking up charges on those accounts. Uh, and then when they're discovered, they close them down and they repeat the process. Uh, for many years, account takeover fraud has, has been a, a really big issue. Uh, so in this case, you're talking about obviously uh, using that same stolen PII uh, and, and then using that to set up or, or compromise an existing account, I should say, and uh, essentially just siphon off those funds into a criminal account. I think just to kind of round it out, overall uh, in security is uh, the mobile security, uh, securing the mobile channel. Uh, so more and more there's a, a tremendous amount of exposure that's coming out from uh, malware, malicious code that's, that's embedded into the banking applications. And certainly being able to, to kind of peel off the user data, that information, uh, is, a, is a great kind of source for uh, executing the ATO uh, fraud, so account takeover. And I think, you know, in terms of the, the size and scope of the, the impact here, you're talking about, just with related fraud, about a $20 billion problem, right, worldwide each year, and that's growing. 
Uh, so certainly a very tough pill for, for banks to swallow and manage over time. Yeah, absolutely. And then you work with you know different types of banks, credit unions. Do you notice any variations based on the size of the organization? Um, are the threats pretty similar? Would you say across the board? Yeah. So you know, there's some common themes I think across the the spectrum of banks, um, and then there are some that are that are more unique. So for example, uh, cyber criminal. You know, these guys wake up each morning and they're trying to to, to craft their nefarious plans, right? <laughs> And uh, what they're basically asking is one main question, is the juice worth the squeeze? Because there's some effort involved. And so if you look at a phishing attack, for example, you know, these, these uh, fraudsters are basically looking at you know, a big brand uh, logo because essentially it's a volume game, right? So they know if they get out an email, a phishing email, uh, the probability that they're gonna get one of those bank customers to click through and convert those, right, and monetize that uh, is relatively high, mm -hmm. right? Uh, where I see some exposure that goes across that spectrum, whether it's large or small, is again back into the, the mobile channel, right? So in this case, when you're talking about the, the velocity of malware that's being produced, the volume of it, and the innovation that these criminals are, are injecting into the process, um, it's just very, very difficult to keep up with. So that, to me, big banks and smaller banks are dealing with that problem across the board. Sure, absolutely. So I'm thinking about some of the things that, that banks can do. Um, obviously, training employees to look for leading indicators of fraud is, is a big piece of it. Um, anything you guys are doing at Wintrust, John, to, to you know, help on the training side? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, training is continual. And I think that's probably yeah. the biggest key is that you've got to continue to train. And whether it's online training, in-person training, or sending out uh, security alerts based on a current trend. As payment systems evolve, so do the fraud schemes. And it's, it's to keep current and keep our employees uh, educated on what the schemes out there, what to look for, we've got to continue to train. And uh, we've, been, we've started a very uh, robust training program on fraud uh, to the front line. Great. Uh, to what's out there, what to look for, what's, what's out, of, out of place. Excellent. And, you know, I opened with this kind of the magic question about what is that balance of, of protecting customers but still providing a really great customer experience. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts there, uh, you know, that you've seen in your role? Well, at, at Wintrust, um, we, we pride ourselves on customer service. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's really one of our hallmarks. And uh, so there, there is a balance there. But it also puts us in a unique position is that our front line, our bankers really know their customers. So it's not uncommon to identify something that's out of norm for a customer and, and red flag it, and then look, look deeper into it. Uh, that is uh, paramount to our success in, in the fraud, preventing fraud. Uh, but at the same time, we, we do make things available, and, we, and as um, customers expect, that ease of transaction, that anonymous transaction, that online account creation, uh, it's imperative that we're, we're monitoring that whether it's uh, human monitoring or uh, electronic monitoring of, of those transactions. Mm -hmm. How about you, David? Your thoughts on, you know, friction is the big buzzword. How much friction do you put into the relationship to protect the customer, um, you know, as well as the bank, but not have it be this awful, you know, experience? Yeah, I think you know, from what we see um, across the customers that we're working with is that um, certainly it's, it's about removing friction from the equation. Uh, I think the, the level of sophistication of, of security technologies that are available today make that much easier. So I think there is a, a story about you can have your cake and eat it too, right? There's not so much this notion of balancing between user experience and security. I think you can do both today. So I think the evolution that we're seeing is kind of using some of the low friction technologies and authentication, for example, with uh, biometrics, which in its own class is evolving quite rapidly. So you started out with fingerprint. You've got facial recognition that's evolving as well. Um, and then you've got kind of the next generation of technologies like behavioral biometrics. So now I can use my mobile device, right? And just based on my behavior of the angle at which I hold my phone, the pressure I use on my keypad, my swipe patterns, and a number of other data points can be used to verify that, yes, it's David Vergara that's, that, that's using this and trying to authenticate. And I think that is, is one way to obviously move um, friction from the equation. I think the longer term is that when you start looking at more sophisticated kind of applications like risk analysis, mm -hmm. so we see more interest in being able to do the, the scoring of all this data that's being pulled off of the behavior of the, the user, um, information that's coming from the device and the application, kind of the integrity of that, um, and even the transaction itself. So 
that becomes a way to, uh, for banks to kind of arm themselves in a way that a risk engine can automate this process, provide a score, and drive a precise level of, of security for each one of those interactions. So that to me is optimal, right? So mm -hmm. best user experience, um, but you're also making sure you're stopping fraud in the process. That's great. So let's just dig a little bit more into that technology side and the potential solutions that are out there. Um, you know, John, we talked about training, that, that human element, certainly, you know, very important. Are you, what are you doing in terms of AI, machine learning? What technologies is Wintrust um, relying on to, to help in well, this area? Well, there's several products out there that we, we rely on. Yeah. Um, and, and some are you know more effective than others, and but all of them still require that human touch or human mm -hmm. uh, review, if you will. And uh, so we do see that uh, generating uh, alerts on things that uh, are transactions that take place that are suspect. Uh, but ultimately, we still need uh, a human to, to review those alerts and that and that data to make an assumption on it, whether a case is fraud or whether it's uh, a good transaction. Sure, and that makes me think of the false positives. I mean, we've dealt with them as consumers, sure. um, you know, and we're on it. You know, we, you know, we understand it on the business end. Um, how are you feeling lately about false positives? Do you feel like they're at an appropriate level for your organization? Anything else you're doing there? I think the uh, the true answer is it depends. Sure. So, some tools uh, are more effective than others, I th uh, but however, regardless of the tool, they do need constant tuning and constant uh, review about are we meeting the right requirements. The other thing is, as uh, schemes evolve, we may want to change the parameters that uh, we're reviewing so the alerts come out in a different way. Are they alerting to different uh, parameters that, that we'll look into? Got it. David, anything else you're seeing technology-wise that you think can really help banks in this area that we haven't touched on? Well, I think, I think there's a, a combination of, of factors that play into this, and I think um, just kind of uh, at a high level, there's this kind of education process, right, for, for all of us consumers and, and bank customers, um, and that, that education is good security hygiene, right? So what should we be doing? How should we be using our bank apps? So, for example, um, understanding that when you're doing a banking transaction, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense or, or good security sense, uh, to be at a Starbucks on a public Wi-Fi, right? Mm -hmm. um, understand where you're downloading your apps from a trusted from a tr trusted site, right? Um, and so a number of those types of examples, just at a high level, I think as you move through that uh, to leverage, and we're seeing more and more of this in terms of securing uh, at login um, and access using stronger security measures, right? Mm -hmm. So MFA, multi-factor authentication, and other types of technology. And then I think, you know, uh, thirdly, again, going back to what we see most across our base and the customers that we're working with is that there's just this wave of interest and awareness around the mobile app. If mm -hmm. that's one theme that I guess I would mm -hmm. stress, it's there's a tremendous amount of vulnerability that they're seeing there. And to get their hands around that has been quite a challenge. Got it. So to wrap up, um, and really last question, I think, when it, and it's something that we hear as an objection a lot of time to implementing some of this new technology that could really help, is, oh, we've got these legacy systems. And mm -hmm. it's hard to get the new stuff to play nice with the legacy system. John, do you, do you feel that firsthand, trying to plug in these more modern um, protectors into your older systems? Uh, that's definitely a challenge. It's yeah. always going to be a concern. And is uh, Ultimately, I make a decision, is this the right tool or solution for what we have? And does this work for us? Is it compatible to what we've already got in place? Uh, so that's always, that's always a challenge. I would say that one thing going back to training as well as uh, mobile apps and, and what we see is that uh, part of it is training our customers mm -hmm. and putting uh, things in our products that alert customers that we would never ask for your social security number. Mm -hmm. We'll never at call you and ask you for your account number. We've got that information. So that's a big part piece going forward of uh, automated systems is alerting the customer and educating the customers that we wouldn't ask for this information. If someone's asking you for this, there's a problem. David, what, how about you? I'm sure you're dealing with legacy systems all sure, day. Sure, all, all the time. Yeah. And, and you know, so for, for the traditional banks, um, certainly the rip and, rip and replace is not an option, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to do uh, substantial forklift overhauls, we just don't see. Um, I have seen rare examples of it, but it's not common. Uh, it's definitely uh, uh, more the case that um, our banks are coming to us with a specific uh, prioritized problem or use case that they're looking to address uh, within the business. Uh, so for example, we've got customers that will come to us and say, hey, we've, we've had some exposure. Uh, again, going back to kind of the, the mobile application, uh, we've detected malware on this, it's caused some problems. Um, we're seeing some uh, exposure through this. 
uh, what technologies are available for that, right? Um, so they'll look at technologies like application shielding or code obfuscation to protect the app, right? Um, I think uh, others may be looking to kind of continue that the digital transformation efforts that they've got going. So they want to streamline, you know, workflows and get some efficiencies out of that, start to remove more of the paper uh, work that's flying around for opening up new accounts. And maybe they want to deploy kind of a, you know, more of an e-signature digital signing as a part of that process. So there's a number of examples where they come kind of looking at these technologies in a modular way. Um, and as you pointed out, I mean, this, this, is, this is about uh, how do you modernize kind of step by step and then kind of either in parallel to those efforts or as a kind of a phase two, uh, they're looking a lot more at the common ways, the platforms that they can bring these applications together uh, and utilize some of the efficiencies, for example, from cloud. We're seeing a lot more uh, interest in cloud technologies, cloud compute and the integration of these applications on, on those platforms. And I think the last stage that we're seeing as a part of this is that you know, ultimately this is about moving those uh, security technologies throughout the organization. So one thing that was uh, a little bit surprising to me is just that how kind of siloed in some cases some of the banks are. And this is not unusual, right? Because over time, right, through M&A sure. and acquisitions and development of the business, um, they've inherited different kinds of technologies, and this is kind of this patchwork quilt of security that they've got in place. And so to be able to standardize that uh, is also of, of, uh, of big importance that we're seeing. Yeah, I'm sure you feel that very, very well. <laughs> Actually, yeah. I, I, you know, I think there's not an organization out there, at least a, a multifunction organization, that doesn't deal with silos. Sure. Yeah. And, and trying to identify that one solution that's useful for everybody is just almost impossible. Right, yeah. you know. absolutely. Well, John, David, thank you so much. I think we covered some really great points and we'll get people thinking about some of the things, um, some of the technology solutions that are available, but also just the importance of, of training and that human element when it comes to fraud prevention and cybersecurity. Really appreciate your sharing your insights with us today. And BAI will continue to follow this topic because I'm sure a year from now there'll be a whole other set of things we'll be looking at. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.